Hello, America. My name is Dylan John, and you are listening to Nature and the Nation. For today's episode, I will be looking at The Will to Believe and Other Essays in Popular Philosophy by William James. This was published in 1897, I believe, the first edition. Uh, and, yeah, 1897. Quite some time ago. William James, of course, being an early pragmatist. Last episode, I talked about pragmatism and I talked about Charles Peirce. And uh, if you haven't listened to that one, you should check it out. This, uh, this book contains essays by William James, the oldest of which is one called The Sentiment of Rationality which was written in 1879 and in part, and then the rest of it was completed in 1880. So when I was talking about Charles Peirce last episode, uh, I talked about a few uh, essays that he had written. Those were published in 1877 and 1878, and those were Charles Peirce's uh, most famous essays. I believe the fixation of belief and how to make our ideas clear. And Charles Peirce laid down some of the fundamentals of pragmatism in those two essays. And so that's 1877, 1878. Then 1879, William James writes this essay here called The Sentiment of Rationality. It's 1879 and then completes it, comes back and revises it, finishes it in 1880. So this is following on the heels of Charles Peirce's writing. So although there, although there are a lot of essays in this book, um, including the title essay, I'm just going to look at this one essay here because I feel like this, well, like I said, it's the oldest essay in the book. It's the it's basically one of William James's first major writings. It's it's in fact it's the oldest of James's writings that I'm aware of that's been published in any major form. Um, he, there might be some older, earlier stuff, probably like postgraduate work and whatnot. But uh, this is one of his, let's say, earliest essays. It's the longest one in the book, and I think it's the most important one in the book. I think it's even more important than the title essay, The Will to Believe. So I'm only going to look at this one essay. Um, like I said, they run, they run a range from, uh, from 1879 through uh, 1896. So a full, what's that, 17 years? Uh, and I think it was published right after the most recent essay. And the publisher, or William James, probably wanted to make those essays, like, put them right front and center because they were the most recent ones. And the order, uh, of course, in the essays is all off because of that. If it was me, I would, pub I would put the oldest essay at the beginning of the book and the last essay at the end of the book. And then you could kind of read along and see his thought process. There are issues that are raised in this first essay that he continues to address in other essays throughout the book. So the sort of concepts that come up, he, he takes Charles Peirce's ideas and he interprets them in his own way. You know, He introduces questions that are really sort of religious questions into you know, what Peirce is saying and what the religious implications are. And so he published psychology in 1890, the two-volume set. Uh, and so the earliest essays in here are before he published psychology, and the later essays are afterwards. And the whole time that he published psychology, he was wrestling with these questions, and it's largely questions of, like, free will. I think that comes down to, that's, like, one of the core questions that he's wrestling with. He's asking himself, and he's he's answered the question, but it nevertheless remains an ongoing subject of discussion for him. I think he was wrestling with determinism. He was wrestling with the idea that the human mind, as he discusses in psychology, is really this biological organ. You know, it's, a, it's an organ and it's got all these physical structures that 
guide and determine how it operates. And he was talking about instincts, he was studying instincts, and he was putting forward the idea that humans have all sorts of instincts and the things that we do are um, influenced constantly by instincts and the, and the ramifications of these instincts and the balances between the instincts. And he starts trying to find free will. And he's like, I think he's sort of struggling to find free will in his examinations of the human mind. And so while he, that doesn't really come through the psychology books, at least it doesn't really come through the abridged version uh, that he put out a few years later, which is the one that I, the one that I read. But the two volume set, I mean, it's just a, it seems like it's just a lot of information about the biology of the brain and the and the and the mechanisms and the structures of the human mind. So while he's writing all this, he's wrestling with these questions about free will and God and humans, humankind, and he begins studying philosophy. And after he finishes the psychology book, he puts out another book. He puts, well, he puts out this one in 1897, and then he puts out another book uh, in 1902 called The Varieties of Religious Experience. So you can see it's like this ongoing question of religion at the same time that he's studying and teaching psychology. But this is the this is the essay here that I want to get into is I think where he really begins his philosophical journey. So that's the one I want to focus on exclusively. And I've got a bunch of sections here that I want to look at. I'm going to almost go through the entire essay um, very methodically to see what he is saying. I think in this essay we see some of the the uh, some more of the birth of pragmatism. So, in this episode, like all my episodes, I'm going to read a number of sections here out loud and provide some responses and some interpretation. You know, I'm not going to provide a, a, a tremendous amount because I have so many sections I want to read, like eleven or twelve. I'm going to read a, a bunch of this, a whole bunch of this essay. So let's start off. He says, quote, What is the task which philosophers set themselves to perform, and why do they philosophize at all? Almost everyone will immediately reply. They desire to attain a conception of the frame of things which shall on the whole be more rational than that somewhat chaotic view which everyone by nature carries about with him under his hat. But suppose this rational conception attained. How is the philosopher to recognize it for what it is, and not let it slip through their ignorance? The only answer can be that he will recognize its rationality, as he recognizes everything else, by certain subjective marks with which it affects him. When he gets the marks, he may know that he has got the rationality. What, then, are the marks? A strong feeling of ease, peace, rest is one of them. The transition from a state of puzzle and perplexity to rational comprehension is full of lively relief and pleasure. But this relief seems to be a negative rather than a positive character. Shall we then say that the feeling of rationality is constituted merely by the absence of any feeling of irrationality? I think there are very good grounds for upholding such a view. All feeling whatever, in the light of certain recent psychological speculations, seems to depend for its physical condition not on simple discharge of nerve currents, but on their discharge under arrest, impediment, or resistance. Just as we feel no particular pleasure when we breathe freely, but a very intense feeling of distress when the respiratory motions are prevented, so any unobstructed tendency to action discharges itself without the production of much cognitive accompaniment and any perfectly fluent course of thought awakens but little feeling. But when the movement is inhibited, or when the thought meets with difficulties, we experience distress. It is only when the distress is upon us that we can be said to strive, to crave, or to aspire. When enjoying plenary freedom, either in the way of motion or of thought, we are in a sort of anesthetic state, in which we might say with Walt Whitman, if we cared to say anything about ourselves at such times, I am sufficient as I am. This feeling of the sufficiency of the present moment, of its absoluteness, 
This absence of all need to explain it, account for it, or justify it is what I call the sentiment of rationality. As soon, in short, as we are enabled from any cause whatever to think with perfect fluency, the thing we think of seems to us pro tanto rational. Whatever modes of conceiving the cosmos facilitate this fluency produce the sentiment of rationality. Conceived in such modes, being vouches for itself and needs no further philosophic formulation. But this fluency may be obtained in various ways. And first, I will take up the theoretic way. The facts of the world in their sensible diversity are always before us. But our theoretic need is that they should be conceived in a way that reduces their manifoldness to simplicity. Our pleasure at finding that a chaos of facts is the expression of a single underlying fact is like the relief of the musician at resolving a confused mass of sound into melodic or harmonic order. The simplified result is handled with far less mental effort than the original data, and a philosophic conception of nature is thus in no metaphorical sense a labor-saving contrivance. The passion for parsimony, for economy of means and thought, is the philosophic passion par excellence, and any character or aspect of the world's phenomena which gathers up their diversity into monotony will gratify that passion, and in the philosopher's mind stand for that essence of things, compared with which all their other determinations may by him be overlooked. More universality or extensiveness is, then, one mark which the philosopher's conceptions must possess. Unless they apply to an enormous number of cases, they will not bring him relief. The knowledge of things by their causes, which is often given as a definition of rational knowledge, is useless to him unless the causes converge to a minimum number, while still producing the maximum number of effects. The more multiple, then, are the instances, the more flowingly does his mind rove from fact to fact. The phenomenal transitions are no real transitions. Each idea is the same old friend, with a slightly altered dress. Who does not feel the charm of thinking that the moon and the apple are, as far as their relation to the earth goes, identical, of knowing respiration and combustion to be one, of understanding that the balloon rises by the same law whereby the stone sinks, of feeling that the warmth in one's palm when one rubs one's sleeve is identical with the motion which the friction checks? of recognizing the difference between beast and fish to be only a higher degree of that between human father and son, of believing our strength when we climb the mountain or fell the tree to be no other than the strength of the sun's rays which made the corn grow out of which we got our morning meal. End quote. Okay, so what he's saying in that passage, that's the opening passage, the opening several pages uh, of the essay, He's asking himself, okay, well, what are people, what are philosophers doing? Why are they philosophizing? Well, they're looking for a rational uh, concept of the world. He says specifically, they desire to attain a conception of the frame of things, which shall on the whole be more rational than the somewhat chaotic view, which everyone by nature carries about with them under his hat. What he means is that we live in this sort of sensory chaos, sounds, sights, images, Touch, the whole nine yards, feelings, feelings from without, feelings from within, a chaos, sort of chaotic jumble of sensation. The philosopher wants to make something more rational than the jumble of chaos that is experienced in the raw. So then he says, okay, so if, you, if, if, if the philosopher were to achieve this rational conception of the world... A, a conception that is more rational than the chaos of experience, how would he know that he has achieved it? How would he know that he has arrived? He says the only answer can be that he will recognize its rationality the same way he recognizes everything else. He would recognize it by certain subjective marks with which it affects him. When he gets those marks, he knows he's got the rationality. What are these marks? What are, the, what are the signals that the philosopher will receive that will indicate to him that he is in the presence of a rational concept? Well, 
Uh, he says a strong feeling of ease, peace, and rest. The, the transition from a state of puzzle and perplexity to a state of rational comprehension is full of lively relief and pleasure, sort of mental pleasure. You can tell when something is doesn't make sense, when something doesn't feel rational, it doesn't feel like it's connected. There's a sort of incongruity or, or struggle even, and a, and a sense of pleasure when everything starts to fall into place, to make sense. He says the relief seems to be a negative rather than a positive character. It's not so much that something becomes rational, so much as that it loses its irrationality. He says if you're just thinking about things that make sense rationally, you don't put much mental effort into them. You might not put any mental effort into them at all. If it just makes sense on the whole and you've never questioned it, you just accept it. It's only when something starts to not make sense that you start putting mental effort toward it. He says, just as we feel no particular pleasure when we breathe freely, but intense feeling of distress when respiratory motions are prevented, so any unobstructed tendency to action discharges itself without the production of much cogitative accompaniment, and any perfectly fluent course of thought awakens but little feeling. But when the movement is inhibited, or when the thought meets with difficulties, we experience distress. So the sentiment of rationality is a sort of easygoing, pleasurable, contented, quasi-automatic state of mind. That's what philosophers are looking for, is sort of a peace of mind. And as they uncover questions about reality, their sense of ease becomes disrupted, and they try to work through these problems to get to a, a sense of rationality. So because, he, because there's this desire to, to make a multitude of things fit together into fewer and fewer rational principles, you know, even if, the, even if you pick up a couple of rational principles, even the rational principles themselves feel more rational when they themselves are connected to a greater principle. The deeper and more universal the underlying principle, the more rational the whole thing feels. So he says, more universality or extensiveness is one mark which the philosopher's conceptions must possess. Unless they apply to an enormous number of cases, they won't bring him relief. The more widespread the effects of the, of the core rational principle, the more ground is covered by this principle, the more relief is felt. The knowledge of things by their causes, which is often given as a definition of rational knowledge, is useless to him unless the causes converge to a minimum number while still producing the maximum number of effects. And then he gives a few examples. He says, who doesn't feel the charm thinking that the moon and the apple are both related to the earth in the same way? The same principle causes a balloon to rise that causes a stone to sink the way everything is kind of connected. Isn't that a sense of relief or joy when you think about the connectedness of things? So what's interesting is he's tying this back to almost a personal subjective feeling. The philosopher wants to feel things make sense. And no matter how many formulas are used to make things make sense, the question, well, why are you making the formulas in order to make things make sense? Because ultimately the philosopher wants things to make sense. Because he feels a sense of pleasure at their rationality. Anyway, moving on from there, he says, quote, Alongside of this passion for simplification, there exists a sister passion, which in some minds, though they perhaps form the minority, is its rival. This is the passion for distinguishing. It is the impulse to be acquainted with the parts, rather than to comprehend the whole. Loyalty to clearness and an integrity of perception, dislike of blurred outlines of vague identifications, are its characteristics. It loves to recognize particulars in their completeness, and the more of these it can carry, the happier it is. <clears throat> 
It prefers any amount of incoherence, abruptness, and fragmentariness, so long as the literal details of the separate facts are saved, to an abstract way of conceiving things that, while it simplifies them, dissolves away at the same time their concrete fullness. Clearness and simplicity thus set up rival claims and make a real dilemma for the thinker. A man's philosophic attitude is determined by the balance in him of these two cravings. No system of philosophy can hope to be universally accepted among men which grossly violates either need, or entirely subordinates the one to the other. The fate of Spinoza, with his barren union of all things in one substance on the one hand, that of Hume, with his equally barren looseness and separateness of everything, on the other, neither philosopher owning any strict and systematic disciples today, each being to posterity a warning as well as a stimulus, shows us that the only possible philosophy must be a compromise between an abstract monotony and a concrete heterogeneity. But the only way to mediate between diversity and unity is to class the diverse items as cases of a common essence which you discover in them. Classification of things into extensive kinds is thus the first step, and classification of their relations and conduct into extensive laws is the last step in their philosophic unification. A completed theoretic philosophy can thus never be anything more than a completed classification of the world's ingredients, and its results must always be abstract, since the basis of every classification is the abstract essence embedded in the living fact, the rest of the living fact being, for the time, ignored by the classifier. This means that none of our explanations are complete. They subsume things under heads wider or more familiar, but the last heads, whether of things or of their connections, are mere abstract genera, data which we find just in things and write down. When, for example, we think that we have rationally explained the connection of the facts A and B by classing both under the common attribute X. It is obvious that we have really explained only so much of these items as is X." End quote. So now he begins to introduce a second, uh, a second interest of the philosopher. In addition to a sort of desire to universalize and simplify everything, there is a desire for clarification, distinguishing, concreteness. You might even look at this and see the sort of resemblance, vaguely, uh, to the Apollonian and Dionysian instincts uh, of Nietzsche back in Birth of Tragedy. A similar sort of uh, unification and blending together in an almost Dionysian way, a connecting of disparate things, but also a clarification and distinguishing a disinterest in blurriness or vagueness, an interest in precise clarification of each individual thing. Um, and these are sort of competing claims on philosophy. And he uses Spinoza and Hume as examples of people who've taken gone too far in either direction. Spinoza going too far in the direction of unity and Hume going too far in the direction of disunity or of separateness of things. Uh, he says, and the only philosophy that's going to work is going to be some sort of compromise between these, and the best and first mechanism of compromise is a sort of clar classification, that these things are similar to these other things, but they're separate from those things. And that sort of classification of the ingredients of the world, as he says, uh, is the fundamental task of philosophy. And he also says that so long as explanation of things remains a sort of classification, he says that none of our explanations are complete. They subsume things under heads, headings. Uh, and he gives the example, uh, if you're understanding things by connecting them between them, the classification or the, the header, the, the genus or species of item, the family of item that you apply objects to can only describe the items insofar as they are members of that family. Anyway, moving on from there, a little bit later, he says, quote, Hence the unsatisfactoriness of all our speculations. On the one hand, 
So far as they retain any multiplicity in their terms, they fail to get us out of the empirical sand heap world. On the other, so far as they eliminate multiplicity, the practical man despises their empty barrenness. The most they can say is that the elements of the world are such and such, and that each is identical with itself wherever found. But the question, where is it found, the practical man is left to answer by his own wit. Which of all the essences shall here and now be held the essence of this concrete thing? The fundamental philosopher never attempts to decide. We are thus led to the conclusion that the simple classification of things is, on the one hand, the best possible theoretic philosophy, but is, on the other, a most miserable and inadequate substitute for the fullness of the truth. It is a monstrous abridgment of life, which, like all abridgments, is got by the absolute loss and casting out of real matter. This is why so few human beings truly care for philosophy. The particular determinations which she ignores are the real matter exciting needs, quite as potent and authoritative as hers. What does the moral enthusiast care for philosophical ethics? Why does the aesthetic of every German philosopher appear to the artist an abomination of desolation? The entire man who feels all needs by turns will take nothing as an equivalent for life but the fullness of living itself. Since the essences of things are, as a matter of fact, disseminated through the whole extent of time and space, it is in their spread outness and alternation that he will enjoy them. When weary of the concrete clash and dust and pettiness, he will refresh himself by a bath in the eternal springs or fortify himself by a look at the immutable natures. But he will only be a visitor, not a dweller in the region. He will never carry the philosophic yoke upon his shoulders. And when tired of the gray monotony of her problems and insipid spaciousness of her results, will always escape gleefully into the teeming and dramatic richness of the concrete world. End quote. So here he's talking about the unsatisfactoriness of philosophy. And he says that uh, the sort of classification is the best possible philosophy, and yet it's barren and empty compared to the material world. He says it's a monstrous abridgment of life, which, like all abridgments, is got by the absolute loss and casting out of real matter. And he says the particular determinations which she ignores are the real matter exciting needs quite as potent and authoritative as hers. He says the entire man uh, may be a visitor, but not a dweller in the region of philosophy. He may step in there and enjoy it, but he'll get, grow tired uh, of its gray monotony, the gray monotony of her problems and insipid spaciousness of her results. The entire man will always escape gleefully into the teeming and dramatic richness of the concrete world. So let's move to the next section where he says, uh, he says, so our study turns back here to its beginning. Every way of classifying a thing is but a way of handling it for some particular purpose. Conceptions, kinds, are teleological instruments. No abstract concept can be a valid substitute for a concrete reality except with reference to a particular interest in the conceiver. The interest of theoretic rationality, the relief of identification, is but one of a thousand human purposes. When others rear their heads, it must pack up its little bundle and retire till its turn recurs. The exaggerated dignity and value that philosophers have claimed for their solutions is thus greatly reduced. The only virtue their theoretic conception need have is simplicity, and a simple conception is an equivalent for the world only so far as the world is simple. The world, meanwhile, whatever simplicity it may harbor, being also a mightily complex affair. Enough simplicity remains, however, and enough urgency in our craving to reach it to make the theoretic function one of the most invincible of human impulses. The quest of the fewest element of things is an ideal that some will follow as long as there are men to think at all. End quote. So here he's saying that every classification that occurs 
uh, occurs for a reason. And the reason is uh, varied. Any sort of purposes, any number of purposes could be the reason that, that people classify things. He says, uh, though, that the interest of theoretic rationality, uh, the relief of identification, is but one of a thousand human purposes. So the, the needs that are satisfied, the human desires that are satisfied by the process of engaging in philosophy are only one of many, many human desires. And their fulfillment is no more or less important than the other various needs of fulfillment that human beings live by. And the when you understand this, the sort of exaggerated dignity and value that philosophers have claimed for their solutions, despite none of them agreeing with any one, other one of them about what those solutions are, uh, is greatly reduced when, when you understand that the true purpose of philosophy is to satisfy the subjective desires of the philosopher. But he says, he says that simplicity only applies to the world insofar as the world is simple. The world is not entirely simple, although there is simplicity in the world, there is also much complexity. But there's also enough simplicity in the world and enough underpinnings to the world that the quest remains. So moving on from there, uh, he says a little bit later, quote, The peace of rationality may be sought through ecstasy when logic fails. To religious persons of every shade of doctrine, moments come when the world, as it is, seems so divinely ordered, and the acceptance of it by the heart so rapturously complete, that intellectual questions vanish, nay, the intellect itself is hushed to sleep. As Wordsworth says, thought is not, in enjoyment it expires. Ontological emotion so fills the soul that ontological speculation can no longer overwrap it and put her girdle of interrogation marks round existence. Even the least religious of men must have felt with Walt Whitman when loafing on the grass on some transparent summer morning that swiftly arose and spread round him the peace and knowledge that pass all the argument of the earth. At such moments of energetic living, we feel as if there were something diseased and contemptible, yea, vile, in theoretic grubbing and brooding. In the eye of healthy sense, the philosopher is at best a learned fool, since the heart can thus wall out the ultimate irrationality which the head ascertains, the erection of its procedure into a systematized method would be a philosophic achievement of first-rate importance. But as used by mystics hitherto, it lacks universality, being available for few persons and at few times, and even in these being apt to be followed by fits of reaction and dryness. And if men should agree that the mystical method is a subterfuge without logical pertinency, a plaster but no cure, and that the idea of non-entity can never be exercised, empiricism will be the ultimate philosophy. Existence, then, will be a brute fact, to which, as a whole, the emotion of ontologic wonder shall rightfully cleave, but remain eternally unsatisfied. End quote. All right, so what he's saying here is that at times, logic fails. At times, the logical mind does not put everything together. It doesn't achieve the sort of completion, sense of relief. And that the spirit, the soul, the emotion, he says, ecstasy takes in and can achieve the peace of rationality, or at least can be sought. The peace of rationality can be sought through ecstasy when logic fails. He says, to religious persons of every shade of doctrine, moments come when the world as it is seems so divinely ordered and acceptance of it by the heart so rapturously complete that intellectual questions vanish. In certain moments of religious ecstasy, the intellectual question vanishes. And even, he says, for the not religious person, loafing on the grass on a transparent summer morning must have felt like Walt Whitman. <laughs> 
feeling that swiftly arose and spread round him the peace and knowledge that pass all the argument of the earth. Transcending argument and feeling in that moment, he says, at such moments of energetic living, we feel as if there was something diseased and contemptible in theoretic grubbing and brooding. In the eye of healthy sense, the philosopher is at best a learned fool. So there's an alternate method of achieving a sense of rationality, the sentiment of rationality, the sort of peaceful mental feeling when the problems feel solved. He says, if this were possible to, ha to bring about in everybody, there would be no philosophy. We'd all be quite contented and happy. But he says, as used by mystics, it lacks universality because it's available only for a few persons and at a few times. And even in those people, sometimes, well, he says, apt to be followed by fits of reaction and dryness. It's not a permanent state of mind. It's a sort of rapturous moment, but it doesn't last forever. It's not a permanent existence. And he says, if men should agree that the mystical method is a subterfuge without logical pertinency, a plaster but no cure, and that the idea of non-entity can never be exercised, then empiricism will be the ultimate philosophy. What he means there, the idea of non-entity can never be exercised, the mystic always seems to drive toward this transcendent oneness in which the separation between things is, is eliminated. What is being separated is the concept of non-entity. And this comes back to Parmenides. Basically, the idea is that when the idea, when non-entity, non-existence is banished because it has, because the non-existent doesn't exist, then only the thing, only that which exists exists, and it it, it enters this state of permanity and oneness in which it lacks any distinction, because distinction uh, of this this thing, that thing, and the other, right? Separation all indicates a multitude. Anyway, he says that that this mysticism will not work. It can't work because non-entity can never be exercised. Empiricism will be the ultimate philosophy. Rather than trying to impose upon the world a sort of unity through mysticism or through rationality, both of these failing, simple observation of what is, taking the driver's seat and letting the rational simplification theoretical processes sit in the back seat for a little while is probably the future of philosophy. That's sort of what he's saying here when he says that empiricism will be the ultimate philosophy. Existence then will be a brute fact to which as a whole the emotion of ontological wonder shall rightfully cleave but remain eternally unsatisfied. So let's move on. The next section, he says, quote, Philosophers long ago observed the remarkable fact that mere familiarity with things is able to produce a feeling of their rationality. The empiricist school has been so much struck by this circumstance as to have laid it down that the feeling of rationality and the feeling of familiarity are one and the same thing, and that no other kind of rationality than this exists. The daily contemplation of phenomena, juxtaposed in a certain order, begets an acceptance of their connection, as absolute as the repose engendered by theoretic insight into their coherence. To explain a thing is to pass easily back to its antecedents. To know it is easily to foresee its consequence. Custom, which lets us do both, is thus the source of whatever rationality the thing may gain in our thought. In the broad sense in which rationality was defined at the outset of this essay, it is perfectly apparent that custom must be one of its factors. We said that any perfectly fluent and easy thought was devoid of the sentiment of irrationality. Inasmuch then as custom acquaints us with all the relations of a thing, it teaches us to pass fluently from that thing to others, and pro tanto tinges it with a rational character. Now there is one particular relation of greater practical importance than all the rest. I mean the relation of a thing to its future consequences. 
So long as an object is unusual, our expectations are baffled. They are fully determined as soon as it becomes familiar. I therefore propose this as the first practical requisite which philosophical conception must satisfy. It must, in a general way at least, banish uncertainty from the future. The permanent presence of the sense of futurity in the mind has been strangely ignored by most writers, but the fact is that our consciousness at a given moment is never free from the ingredient of expectancy. Everyone knows how, when a painful thing has to be undergone in the near future, the vague feeling that it is impending penetrates all our thought with uneasiness and subtly vitiates our mood even when it does not control our attention. It keeps us from being at rest at home in the given present. The same is true when a great happiness awaits us. But when the future is neutral and perfectly certain, we do not mind it, as we say, but give an undisturbed attention to the actual. Let now this haunting sense of futurity be thrown off its bearings or left without an object, and immediately uneasiness takes possession of the mind. But in every novel or unclassified experience, this is just what occurs. We do not know what will come next. And novelty, per se, becomes a mental irritant, while custom, per se, is a mental sedative, merely because the one baffles while the other settles our expectations. Every reader must feel the truth of this. What is meant by coming to feel at home in a new place or with new people? It is simply that, at first, when we take up our quarters in a new room, we do not know what draughts may blow in upon our back, what doors may open, what forms may enter, what interesting objects may be found in cupboards and corners. When, after a few days, we have learned the range of all these possibilities, the feeling of strangeness disappears. And so it does with people, when you have got past the point of expecting any essentially new manifestations from their character. The utility of this emotional effect of expectation is perfectly obvious. Natural selection, in fact, was bound to bring it about sooner or later. It is of the utmost practical importance to an animal that he should have provision of the qualities of the objects that surround him, and especially that he should not come to rest in presence of circumstances that might be fraught either with peril or advantage, go to sleep, for example, on the brink of precipices, in the dens of enemies, or view with indifference some new appearing object that might, if chased, prove an important addition to the larder. Novelty ought to irritate him. All curiosity has thus a practical genesis. We need only look at the physiognomy of a dog or a horse when a new object comes into his view, his mingled fascination and fear, to see that the element of conscious insecurity or perplexed expectation lies at the root of his emotion. A dog's curiosity about the movements of his master or a strange object only extends as far as the point of deciding what is going to happen next. That settled, curiosity is quenched. The dog quoted by Darwin, whose behavior in presence of a newspaper moved by the wind seemed to t testify to a sense of the supernatural, was merely exhibiting the irritation of an uncertain future. A newspaper which could move spontaneously was in itself so unexpected that the poor brute could not tell what new wonders the next moment might bring forth. End quote. So here he begins to talk about familiarity and uh, custom. And he talks about how if, if you're considering uh, that rationality is sort of a, a lack of irrationality, a, lot, a lack of distress over some irrational component of the world, then any other uh, set of thoughts that bring about a sense of ease must also be lacking that sense of irrationality. They, the, a, a sense of custom, a sense of familiarity that brings about a, an, a, a contented state of mind, a sense of personal relief, a good feeling, an easy feeling, is rational to the person who is experiencing it. Uh, he, he gets from this the idea that, uh, well, he, he essentially proposes the first practical requisite which a philosophic conception must satisfy, he says it must, in a general way at least, banish uncertainty from the future. The sense of uneasiness about the future uh, is a hallmark of an irrational situation. 
a dog seeing a newspaper that seems to be moved, you know, without any, you know, he, it's moved by the wind, but the dog doesn't get it for whatever reason that the wind is moving the newspaper, doesn't understand what's happening. Suddenly there's uncertainty in the world. And the uncertainty and the sense of unrest the dog feels is, is because, as William James is proposing, doesn't know what's going to happen next. It sense that all people, he says, all people are future directed. We're all always in a state of expectancy. We're all always thinking about what's going to happen next. Now, it might not be what's going to happen immediately, and it might not occupy all of your mind, but there's a general tendency toward future awareness that is evolutionarily acquired. We like to have in our environments understood. We like to know what's around the corner, uh, and we've evolved this tendency. And this same desire for a sense of uh, settled understanding about the future is also connected to things that are rational. And so he says that's part of a good philosophy. So let's move on from here. In this next section, he says, quote, It is not sufficient for our satisfaction merely to know the future as determined, for it may be determined in either of many ways, agreeable or disagreeable. For a philosophy to succeed on a universal scale, it must define the future congruously with our spontaneous powers. A philosophy may be unimpeachable in other respects, but either of two defects will be fatal to its universal acceptance. First, its ultimate principle must not be one that essentially baffles and disappoints our dearest desires and most cherished powers. A pessimistic principle, like Schopenhauer's incurably vicious will substance, or Hartman's wicked jack-of-all-trades the unconscious, will perpetually call forth essays at other philosophies. Incompatibility of the future with their desires and active tendencies is, in fact, to most men, a source of more disfixed disquietude than uncertainty itself. Witness the attempts to overcome the problem of evil, the mystery of pain. There is no problem of good. But a second and worse defect in a philosophy than that of contradicting our active propensities is to give them no object whatever to press against. A philosophy whose principle is so incommensurate with our most intimate powers as to deny them all relevancy in universal affairs as to annihilate their motives at one blow will be even more unpopular than pessimism. Better face the enemy than the eternal void. This is why materialism will always fail of universal adoption, however well it may fuse things into an atomistic unity, however clearly it may prophesy the future eternity. For materialism denies reality to the objects of almost all the impulses which we most cherish. The real meaning of the impulses, it says, is something which has no emotional interest for us, whatever. End quote. So he's just basically saying in this section that uh, in order for a philosophy to succeed, it has to do a couple things. It has to, uh, the first thing, it has to define the future congruously with our spontaneous powers. So this is sort of like uh, if, if, the, if a philosophy proposes that the world is simply too powerful for you, and it's going to defeat you. Uh, you can try and you can try, but you're not enough for it. It's going to overwhelm you, and you're just tossed along. I mean, he's basically saying the, the ultimate principle must not be one that essentially baffles and disappoints our dearest desires and most cherished powers. In other words, it can't be one that proposes that the world defeats us. Or it can't be a philosophy that defeats us. It won't be accepted. But the second thing is that it can't be a philosophy that ignores us. It can't be a philosophy that says that the world is too big for humans to make a difference. That, that won't be accepted either. And uh, that's related to this next section where he says, quote, It is far too little recognized how entirely the intellect is built up of practical interests. The theory of evolution is beginning to do very good service by its reduction of all mentality 
to the type of reflex action. Cognition, in this view, is but a fleeting moment, a cross-section at a certain point, of which in its totality is a motor phenomenon. In the lower forms of life, no one will pretend that cognition is anything more than a guide to appropriate action. The germinal question concerning things brought for the first time before consciousness is not the theoretic, what is that, but the practical, who goes there, or rather, as Horwitz has admirably put it, what is to be done? In all our discussions about the intelligence of lower animals, the only test we use is that of their acting as if for a purpose. Cognition, in short, is incomplete until discharged in act, and although it is true that the later mental development, which attains its maximum through the hypertrophied cerebrum of man, gives birth to a vast amount of theoretic activity over and above that which is immediately ministerial to practice, yet the earlier claim is only postponed, not effaced, and the active nature asserts its rights to the end. When the cosmos, in its totality, is the object offered to consciousness, the relation is in no whit altered. React on it we must, in some congenial way. It was a deep instinct in Schopenhauer, which led him to reinforce his pessimistic argumentation by a running volley of invective against the practical man and his requirements. No hope for pessimism unless he is slain. End quote. So he's saying how um, the reason that the philosophies that defeat us or the philosophies that ignore us uh, will never gain traction is because the ma man's mind is made for acting in the world. He must be motivated to act. He must be uh, enthusiastic about acting, uh, or he will rebel against any such philosophy. Uh, he says essentially that thought itself was born in animals for practical purposes, and we judge animals' intelligence and we judge animals' thoughts by the things that they do, how they act in the world. And in later periods, the development of the brain has opened up new mental avenues, but nonetheless, it's just a delayed, it's just a delayed act, not a defeated act. The, the, even the higher levels of mental activity are ultimately geared toward doing something with that information. And uh, then a little bit later, he says, quote, The philosophy of evolution offers us today a new criterion to serve as an ethical test between right and wrong. Previous criteria, it says, being subjective, have left us still floundering in variations of opinion and the status belly. Here is a criterion which is objective and fixed. That is to be called good, which is destined to prevail or survive. But we immediately see that this standard can only remain objective by leaving myself and my conduct out. If what prevails and survives does so by my help and cannot do so without that help, if something else will prevail in case I alter my conduct, how can I possibly now, conscious of alternative courses of action open before me, either of which I may suppose capable of altering the path of events, decide which course to take by asking which path events will follow. If they follow my direction, evidently my direction cannot wait on them. The only possible manner in which an evolutionist can use his standard is the obsequious method of forecasting the course society would take but for him and then putting an extinguisher on all personal idiosyncrasies of desire and interest, and with bated breath and tiptoe tread, following as straight as may be at the tail and bringing up the rear of everything. Some pious creatures may find a pleasure in this, but not only does it violate our general wish to lead and not to follow, a wish which is surely not immoral if we but lead aright, but if it be treated as every ethical principle must be treated, namely as a rule good for all men alike, its general observance would lead to its practical refutation by bringing about a general deadlock, each good man hanging back and waiting for orders from the rest. Absolute stagnation would ensue. Happy, then, if a few unrighteous ones contribute an initiative which sets things moving again. End quote. So he's got kind of an interesting and I think maybe uh, mistaken, maybe not, I thought about what evolution says about good and bad 
Um, and he says evolution gives us this new criteria. And people have been arguing back and forth about what's good and bad, what's right and wrong. Uh, and it's all subjective and nobody can come up with the concrete truth of what good and evil is. And he says, here's something which is fixed. Those good things are good because they are destined to prevail or survive. He says, okay, that makes sense except that whoever proposes it has a capa the capacity to influence what survives. So you might say that someone trying to evaluate what's good or bad has to keep their own hands off. They have to look at the other things out there in the world and say what's more or less destined to survive if I don't do anything. So then he's saying, here's the what's good or bad in the world in which I don't exist, right? Here's what everything is like in the world in, in, except for me. And then puts he says, uh, the only possible manner in which an evolutionist can use his standard is the obsequious method of forecasting the course society would take but for him, and then putting a, an extinguisher on all personal idiosyncrasies of desire and interest. And then he says, okay, well, in that case, every good person is hanging in the back waiting for orders from everyone else, and someone else, some unrighteous one who isn't waiting to see what is good or bad by evaluating everything else, steps forward, thankfully, and says, here's what we're going to do. This is his attempt, this is sort of his attempt to attack the evolutionist. And it's a strong, it's a, it's a fairly strong attack. And I'm not going to try to refute it right now. I'm not sure that it's a deep understanding, but it, it, it's, it's, uh, I'm going to have to wrestle with that one a little bit before I respond in, in full. So let me get now to the last section that I want to read here, uh, where he says, quote, Let us now turn to the radical question of life, the question whether this be at bottom a moral or an unmoral universe, and see whether the method of faith may legitimately have a place there. It is really the question of materialism. Is the world a simple, brute actuality, an existence de facto about which the deepest thing that can be said is that it happens so to be, or is the judgment of better or worse, of ought, as intimately pertinent to phenomena as the simple judgment is or is not? The materialistic theorists say that judgments of worth are themselves mere matters of fact, that the words good and bad have no sense apart from subjective passions and interest, which we may, if we please, play fast and loose with at will, so far as any duty of ours to the non-human universe is concerned. Thus, when a materialist says it is better for him to suffer great inconvenience than to break a promise, he only means that his social interests have become so knit up with keeping faith that, those interests once being granted, it is better for him to keep the promise in spite of everything. But the interests themselves are neither right nor wrong except possibly with reference to some ulterior order of interests, which themselves, again, are mere subjective data without character, either good or bad. For the absolute moralists, on the contrary, the interests are not there merely to be felt, they are to be believed in and obeyed. Not only is it best for my social interests to keep my promise, but best for me to have those interests, and best for the cosmos to have this me, like the old woman in the story who described the world as resting on a rock and then explained that rock to be supported by another rock and finally, when pushed with questions, said it was rocks all the way down. He who believes this to be a radically moral universe must hold the moral order to rest either on an absolute and ultimate should or on a series of shoulds all the way down. The practical difference between the subjective sort of moralist and the other one is enormous. The subjectivist in morals, when his moral feelings are at war with the facts about him, is always free to seek harmony by toning down the sensitiveness of the feelings. Being mere data, neither good nor evil in themselves, he may pervert them or lull them to sleep by any means at his command. Truckling, 
compromise, time-serving, capitulations of conscience, are conventionally opprobrious names for what, if successfully carried out, would be on his principles by far the easiest and most praiseworthy method of bringing about that harmony between inner and outer relations, which is all that he means by good. The absolute moralist, on the other hand, when his interests clash with the world, is not free to gain harmony by sacrificing the ideal interests. According to him, these latter should be as they are and not otherwise. Resistance, then, poverty, martyrdom if need be, tragedy in a word, such are the solemn feasts of his inward faith. Not that the contradiction between the two men occurs every day. In commonplace matters, all moral schools agree. It is only in the lonely emergencies of life that our creed is tested. Then routine maxims fail, and we fall back on our gods. It cannot then be said that the question, is this a moral world, is a meaningless and unverifiable question, because it deals with something non-phenomenal. Any question is full of meaning, to which, as here, contrary answers lead to contrary behavior. End quote. So there's a lot to chew on there about whether or not uh, we do, in fact, live in a world that is, at its base, moral or not. Uh, it's, it's one of those ultimate questions. And uh, as I said, William James had struggled with materialism. And uh, he sort of forced himself. He said his first act of free will was believing in free will. He sort of, through an act of will, forced himself to believe in free will and to believe in a moral universe. And ultimately... I think, to believe in God. And that's why this book is called The Will to Believe. He simply says that, well, I'll get into that essay, the title essay, in the next episode. Uh, but he's, he's kind of saying that it's not, a, it's not a, just a material world. What you do in the world does matter. And we, we presume it to be so because if we want to have a philosophy that is good for the world, it will be a philosophy that gives us space to act in the world and to act in the world uh, and have an impact on the world and to have that mean something and have some validity in our philosophy and not be utterly inconsequential. Um, we need to believe that our actions matter. And I suppose the, the method by which our actions matter uh, is the extent to which we believe that it is a world with some sort of moral quality. That's uh, his proposal here, and it's a strong one. As a materialist, uh, you know, I don't agree with everything that James says, but what's interesting is that in many ways he says that the world is materialist in every aspect all the way up until you reach the point by which you make your decision to act. The only thing that is left in this world is the human will. The only area where the system of materialist cause and effect breaks down is at that point of free will. That's what makes the universe moral because that's the only, that's the only question left is what do you do? How do you behave? In ways, it's a huge concession to materialism. Uh, but I'm not going to get any further into that question. I thank you all for listening, and I'm going to come going to come back to this book again next uh, episode and look at the title essay, which was written, uh, what did I say, 17 years later uh, after that one. So uh, I will talk to you then. Goodbye. <laughs>